Oh Lord, by your bountiful goodness, release us from the bonds of our sins, which by reason of our weakness we have brought upon ourselves, that we may stand firm until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the 25th Sunday after Pentecost is written in the book of the prophet Daniel, the 12th chapter. Daniel writes, At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, to his charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the close of the commandments and its meaning. What does God say about these commandments? He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. What does this mean? God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his wrath and not do anything against them. But he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. Therefore, we should also love and trust in him and gladly do what he commands. The epistle reading is again from the book of Hebrews, the 10th chap chapter. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great, high, great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the Holy Gospel.
of St. Mark, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, what will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he. They will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our hymn of the day.
the word of the Lord, St. John chapter 17. Jesus says to his disciples and prays for them in the upper room, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We do not belong to this world. We're exiles here. We've been exiles since the beginning. Since when God had created Adam and Eve and had placed them in the garden to enjoy its bounties, a life that was meant to be free of sin, of death, of struggle. A life that was meant to be enjoyed, even the most difficult task of taking care of the earth, that she would provide bountiful fruit, of raising children, of enjoying the things of this world. Yet, as we were reminded of in our readings for today, especially from our reading from Hebrews chapter 10, it is our fault that we no longer enjoy this creation. And we find ourselves as exiles here in this world. Simply because of one sin. A sin of mistrust. The fact that Adam and Eve did not want to trust in God and in his word, and so instead trusted in themselves above all things. And from that day, Adam and Eve's children, you and me, have become exiles in this world. For after God speaks to Adam and Eve, after he gives them a wonderful promise that he will send a Savior at the right time and at the right place, after covering them up with animal skins, after promising to still take care of them even as they head out of the Garden of Eden, they are not allowed back in. flaming sword and an angel, God keeps his people from being able to return to the tree of life, and having life eternal, especially if in sin. Adam and Eve had become exiles, and so too are we. It doesn't take us very long to understand that. For example, the city of Babylon throughout Scripture from the very beginning in Genesis with the Tower of Babel all the way to the end of Revelation, Babylon stands as a place of exile. A land, a people, a culture that stands against God and His promise. It is in that world that we continue to live today. Though we may not have a Babylon per se back in the Middle East that we can head to and say this is a place of exile. In all actuality we are surrounded by it. It engulfs us. It engulfs our way of life. see that in the book of Daniel today. 
If you look at the opening chapter of Daniel, when he records the exiles being taken from Jerusalem into Babylon itself, we find out that at least at the beginning, the Babylonians were not so against having the Jews there. In fact, in some ways, they were happy to have them there. From the standpoint that eventually they would become just another part of the culture. Take a look at Daniel chapter 1 in your Bibles this week. One of the things that you will notice is those four men that we know so well by their Babylonian names, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And for those of you who grew up, on veggie tails, Rack, Shaq, and Benny were not their original names. They were given to them by the Babylonian court. They were raised to learn the language, to learn the ways of life in Babylon, with the ultimate intent then of if we can teach the leaders of the Jewish people, of the Israelites there, eventually that culture will begin to trickle down to the rest of the people and then spread out into how everyone else thinks, acts, speaks, and ultimately believes. That was the intent, to begin the slow change over time, to get the Israelites to begin to speak and act like other people. Uh, but we know that this didn't happen there in Babylon. When the Jews were taken off into exile, this had been a part of their history throughout the Old Testament. They were constantly being tested by other peoples trying to bring them into themselves, and in fact, there were times when the Israelites themselves wanted to act more like the culture than they wanted to act as God's chosen people. Remember the time that they asked for a king? When they wanted a king because they wanted to be like everybody else. They weren't happy with the Lord as their God and their King. So God gave them exactly what they wanted. Show them the desires of their heart were wrong. And over many, many years, Many, many kings, both those who were faithful and those who were unfaithful, we finally find ourselves here in the book of Daniel. They did change over time. Many of them, when they returned to Jerusalem, had turned away from the Lord. They begun to worship other gods, especially the god of himself, and the cultures that they were surrounded by. You probably know exactly where I'm going today. As the Israelites in the Old Testament spent so much of their time in exile, we too, as Christians, are ones who live in exile. No, not again going to a place called Babylon, being gathered together in one little locale so that that slow cultural change can begin to happen. We live in a new Babylon, a digital Babylon. Now, there were parts of the culture of Babylon that were okay. The fact that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego took Babylonian names were not wrong. They could still live out their faith with 
those meetings. The fact that they had been taught the language of the Babylonians, the fact that they had begun to love and to know some of the culture was okay. As long as they kept the main thing the main thing. And that is what Daniel teaches us in his book. That even living in the midst of the culture, keeping their eyes and their faith on Jesus was the most important thing. From the three men in the fiery furnace, to being, Daniel being thrown into the lion's den, they were willing to stand up in the face of the culture, in the face of the king, Be Christian. Believe and trust in the one true God. We live in a culture that's not necessarily bad. We remember that many of the things that we have today, almost everything in all actuality is a gift from God. It's not necessarily bad. The internet is not wrong. Neither is having a cell phone strapped to your hip and then another one in your breast pocket. There's nothing wrong with enjoying Hulu and Netflix and the wonderful things of this world. There's nothing wrong with the fact that now that cell phone that you have has more information available on it than even the biggest computers back in the day. But that's not the point. The point is, when we begin to fear, love, and trust in those things more than the true God, the worst part so when that digital Babylon begins to infiltrate even into the church. Pretty much like every other pastor in the Missouri Synod, almost all of us have the Bible and the Catechism and a number of other resources at hand on our cell phone. So if I ever do come to your hand and I'm scrolling through my phone, no, it is not because I'm ignoring you and that you are awful dull. Realize this. Just as it's easy for us to come and find the Bible and the Catechism on our phones, how easy it is for us to find anything and everything else. Even for Christians. Youth and adults who used to go to their pastors, who used to go to family and friends for help, for counseling. Ignore them now. Those who used to go to the scriptures to find the assistance that they needed, the hope that could only be provided by the scriptures, now instead head to the God named Google where they can now look up answers to life's toughest questions. How do I know that I'm suicidal? Why don't I have any friends? Is there really a God? We all know what those many answers can be, and of course, with the gods that are there on our handy little wonderful devices that we have, you have as many answers as there are people in the world. We have fallen trap to this digital Babylon. We have begun to use these gifts of God not as gifts of God, but as gods themselves. Now, 
One thing that I want to make sure very clearly is after the divine service is over, we are not going to have a cell phone burning out in the parking lot. <laughs> Those gifts are wonderful. They can be used to the glory of God. We can use them to share the gospel with our friends and with our neighbors. We can use them to bring comfort to those who are hurting, to those who are broken. To let them know that we are here for them. To share the gospel with them. But we must repent when those tools and those gifts become our gods. We've all seen it in our world today. In fact, we've probably seen it in our own congregation. How digital Babylon has pulled away not only many of our young people, but also some of our older folks as well. Who've been sucked into this new culture that we live in today as exiles. Looking for their hope and their comfort and their faith based on the answers of a computer or a cell phone screens, rather than looking to the truth of God's Word. Repent. Repent. Digital Babylon will lead you astray. Turn back. Turn back, for today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that your Lord and Savior comes to you and forgives you again all of your sins. Who sees you wandering around in this Babylon of this world and comes to you. It says, here am I. I will face off with this world. He came into that world thousands of years ago. Into a culture that was already beginning to shift and change. And he lived in the midst of that culture that was already against him. Holding steadfastly to the truth of the word. Facing off with those who wanted to lead the people astray. Holding tightly to the word, knowing that even his own family and friends would have nothing to do with him. Even knowing that his own family and friends would turn their backs on him, there was nothing in comparison that if his father would turn his back on him. That's exactly what his father did. He did the very thing that Jesus speaks of in our gospel reading for today, for the father delivered his son over to death. For from the very beginning, before God created the heavens and the earth and everything that was in them, God the Father was already planning it out to deliver his son over to death for you. For the gift of life. For the forgiveness of your sins. For the resurrection of the dead. When we die, yes, souls go to reside with our Lord in heaven and our bodies rest here in the ground. But as Daniel tells us, that is not the end. Something even greater is to come. For Daniel reminds us that there will be many who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. 
He tells us the Lord will deliver us even from death itself by raising our bodies from the grave, reuniting our souls with them, and giving us everlasting life in the new heaven and the new earth. Life that will no longer be infected with sin. A life that will know no more exile. But only perfect communion with our Heavenly Father and with one another. That is the thing that we hold tight to. The fact that something is coming that is much better, where sin, our flesh, and the world will no longer batter us, but where things will be made perfect, where communion with one another and with God will be just the way it was supposed to be back in the dark of Eden or the fall into sin. So we fight. I guess I should have changed the closing hymn for today to Onward Christian Soldiers, but it's a little late, so I'm not going to do it at that point in time. But the fact is, our Heavenly Father gives us what you need to live in this digital Babylon. He didn't take Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the world. He didn't take them out of Babylon to go and live somewhere else, as some have even said we should do in Christianity today. For them, we would not be able to do what our Lord has called us to do. And that is to share the truth of his word to the others in this Babylon so that they may know also freedom and life from sin. Just like you and I know, even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guard and protect your heart and mind in true faith to life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to please rise and join with me as we continue with the prayers of the church. In our prayers for this day, we remember the family of Pam and Kevy, who was called to her rest in the Lord on Friday. We pray for Larry and his children and for all of their family and friends during this time. As not only they mourned her death, but also that release from the suffering that Tammy has undergone over these last few years. But most especially, we remember too that this is not the end. That as Daniel reminds us today, the resurrection of the dead is just around the corner where we will see our sister in Christ again in her very own flesh. Let us pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. With thanksgiving to God the Father for all his goodness, especially for making his everlasting covenant with us through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, that with every good work we may do his will and be pleasing in his sight, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church throughout the world, both near and far, including our fellow believers at St. Peter's, that we may be ready at all times for Christ's glorious return, and that for our Lord would give us zeal to proclaim his coming to the ends of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all pastors and ministers, 
that they may preach the pure doctrine of God's saving word, which will never pass away, and that those who hear, hear with faith may have the peace that surpasses all understanding. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all in authority, especially the President and Congress of the United States, the Governor and Legislature of Michigan, all judges, and that God would graciously enable them to lead according to his will and for our good. Lord, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. In thanksgiving for the fruits of the earth provided by God's hand, that he would supply the needs of all who grow, process, and distribute our food, and that we may be moved to share his bountiful gifts with our neighbors in their time of need. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and infirm, the dying and all in need, especially Lori, Charlotte, John, Jennifer, Hilda, Vicki, Lillian, Diana, Peggy, Vic, Larry, Jeff, that in their distress, God would grant healing of body and patience to endure their afflictions. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who approach the altar at Christ's gracious invitation, that they may find favor in his eyes and receive his true body and blood for the salvation of their souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who mourn, we thank God for all the mercies that he granted to our sister Tammy, that during her earthly life, especially calling her to faith in Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you would comfort the survivors who mourn her death with the hope of the glorious resurrection and a joyful reunion at the last day. Keep us mindful that we are all mortal, so that we will ever be prepared to die in the faith and finally receive the glory and promise to all who trust in your Son. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Grant these and all our petitions, O God, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
because he has now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, and especially with our sister Tammy, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Your sins are. 
are forgiven. Amen.
given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We join in our closing hymn with the selected verses.
mortuary, and so hopefully soon thereafter we will have times and dates of all of the activities. Um, I will let the elders know. We may even put it on the phone here at church, just in case you want to call here later on this afternoon. Um, I'll have it on the, the answering machine if you want to check that. I'm sure it won't take very long after I've shared with Keith and Murray and Norman the details that it will get out to the rest of you. Um, I'd also expect it to be on Gander Nellick. Gander Nellick? Gander Nellick? Gander Nellick? Which one is it? Gander Nellick? Okay. Anyways, it will also be on their website as well when we have um, all the details for that this week. Um, also, a reminder as well, we have our Thanksgiving Eve service coming up here in just a couple of weeks, if you can believe that. Um, Thanksgiving is right here, um, which means, of course, that our congregational meeting, yeah, that's the thing I'm going with, um, our congregational meeting to talk about work plan and budget for 2022 will be that Sunday after on the 28th, so make sure that you come back the meeting that afternoon, make sure you get back, okay, if you're traveling, um, for that as well. And of course, that also means that Advent is right around the corner. Um, I believe Advent starts the last Sunday in November this year. Um, so if you can believe that, we'll already start celebrating our Lord's imminent arrival um, here in November. Um, trying to think if there was anything else in the bullet. Um, the invitations for the Advent tea. Carol. I was told not to say anything about it. Uh, Sarah said that if I called on her, she'd be like, Carol. So I'm just or Linda, giving or, or Linda. Or, but I'm going with Carol, because Carol's the first one that I saw. <laughs> we have? We have the invitations. We will, um, Debbie and I will be at the door over there by the office. And Linda and Sarah will be over here with Pastor. We will be getting up invitations to the Advent tea. Please do an RSVP by the 21st of November, I believe. And it's ladies only. Sorry, guys. Oh. <laughs> Maybe next year we'll do it, guys, too. You never know. We can have like a gentleman's bar. Guys being like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> like, come on, guys, don't let me hang. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, yes, that's, I'm sorry. I love you too. <laughs> also, um, a, a very, a very large thank you from Sarah and I. Um, yes, you honestly did get us last Sunday. We had no idea what was happening, all of the plans that were being made for the, the annual harvest dinner um, that I kept calling it. Um, thank you so much for the food and for the time together and for all of the gifts and um, just the, the love that you have shown us since we've been here with you, especially through Sarah's surgery a few months ago and everything that happened in, um, over the last few months. Thanks be to God. We give thanks for all of you. Um, so, anyways, thank you. Am I forgetting anything? You don't think so? Okay. Christ is risen! He is